And this webinar is based on Holly's most recent book, Happiness is Running Through the Streets to Find You, Translating Trauma's Harsh Legacy into Healing. And we'll talk a little bit more about that book at the end. So to recovering attorney Holly Elisa, life is too short to do anything but enjoy it daily. Holly? Thanks, Kim. And hello, everybody across Ohio, in New York, in Texas, wherever you are. Thank you. Thank you for being here and thank you for devoting your life to making a difference. As Kim said, I'm a recovering attorney. I didn't start out in early childhood, but I saw the light when I realized what you do every day makes a difference. Every day makes a difference. And I'm here also to say that I'm one of those kids that you made a difference to. I wouldn't be here if it weren't for the teacher who saw me as a very troubled little kid who was taking care of her sick mother at home but couldn't talk about that, I wouldn't be here if that teacher hadn't seen me and said to me, you're a special little girl and someday you're gonna make a difference. So to each one of you that's there, you are making a difference. If you are a family provider, thank you. If you are a teacher's aide, thank you. If you're a director worried about your staff, thank you. If you're a preschool teacher, thank you. If you are an, in the infant room and all the babies start crying at once, <laughs> you know what to do. So I'm here to say, look, how can happiness be running through the streets in the middle of this pandemic? Am I crazy? Well, yeah, but that's part of being in early childhood, right? We, 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 we believe in emergent curriculum. We go with the flow. We go with what comes along and we find a way to find hope in the midst of it. And that's what we're gonna talk about, guys. But first, let's just level with each other. We all have pain, we all have sorrow, right? The guy that wrote those lyrics just died during this pandemic. Um, just think for a moment, if you're willing to, of, of a loss that you've had recently as a result of this pandemic. How many of you, for example, have, um, a family member who's in the hospital and you cannot go to visit? How many of you have students, children that you used to be with every day and now you can't be with them? How many of you have um, loss of income? Oh my goodness, worried about how you're gonna support your family. All these things are not about happiness running through the streets to find us, but what are they about? For me, they're about telling the truth with love telling the truth with love. And what's that about? What that's about is this, even in the worst of times, there is something of beauty, beauty that can emerge. Even in the worst of times, there's something of hope that can emerge. And you know it's inside of you. So I, I invited you think of, to think about one of the sadnesses, one of the losses. And I'll tell you right now, the first Saturday of the pandemic, my last uncle, Uncle Arturo Bruno from Rochester, New York, died. He was 20 years younger than my father, Vincenzo Bruno. And I didn't get to go to his funeral. I didn't get to, um, I'm just checking my time here. Yeah, I didn't get to go to the funeral. I didn't get to go hug Aunt Conchetta. I didn't get to say goodbye to my uncle because I couldn't fly. No one could fly, and I'm 74. It was, would have been unwise. That was a tragedy. That felt like such a loss. It was saying goodbye to Arthur, but it was saying goodbye to that whole generation of immigrant children that came to this country. And I know people whose daughters are giving birth in hospitals and you can't be there with them. So these are the losses. These are the losses, and I know each one of you has them. And telling the truth with love means Yes, honoring those losses, embracing those losses, and then saying, how on earth can happiness find me in the midst of all of this? And that quote, by the way, um, ever since happiness heard your name, it's been running through the streets to find you. That quote is from Hafiz, and it's way back in like, I don't know, 12th century or something. And here's what it means to me. No matter how bad things are, there is always a moment of grace 
there's always a moment of light. And now I'm going to invite you to recall those moments of light. Um, what is a moment of hope that has come to you in the midst of this pandemic? What is a moment of humor? What's a moment of joy? What's a moment of connection? Because it's connection that keeps us alive. Honest, heart-to-heart, -heart, soulful connection. So I'm gonna share one with you as you're thinking about a moment of joy for you. I'm gonna share one with you. <laughs> Cracks me up. There, um, I'm connected with the directors group in uh, central Massachusetts. And I keep getting all these ping, 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 pings because they're always like connecting and helping each other out. And, you know, it's gone from scary to hopeful to hopeful to scary. Um, and one of the directors who shut down, she didn't have the um, essential uh, families there. What did she do? She took her little white car and she decorated it like a bunny. <laughs> She decorated herself like a bunny and she had one of her staff members with her and the two of them drove all around to the families in the program dropping off spring baskets. I mean, we don't drop off Easter baskets or, or, or Passover baskets. She dropped off these beautiful spring baskets and she did it appropriately. She did it appropriately with, with um, you know, the distancing, but those babies saw her coming just like those children can see you coming. How many of you, for example, are doing this beautiful thing where you're zooming in to be with your kids each day? Another thing that gives me hope is this a, a colleague in Prince Edward Island who loves her children so much and she gets on, they call her Miss Cloud because her last name sounds like Cloud. So they call her Miss Cloud and every day I can watch Miss Cloud walk into her classroom, sit down in her rocking chair, they shake out their sillies, and she gives the children that predictability every day. I want to tell you that um, when I was studying trauma, and I am a survivor of trauma, when I was studying the ACEs study, and I was studying all of the trauma-informed literature, I came upon a man that I interviewed. His name is Dr. John Medina. And I said to him, John, in the midst of trauma, what is the one thing you would tell us educators, especially us early childhood ed educators, what's the one thing you would tell us we need to offer the children, that we need to provide for the children? And honestly, and when I'm getting distracted here is because I'm trying to keep track of my time because I'm really bad as a timekeeper. But honestly, I thought, I mean, let me ask you that question, guys. What would you say? What would you say if I asked you in this, in this time of the pandemic, in this time of isolation, in this time of people getting sick and dying, in this time of loss, and I think in this time of hope, what is the one thing that we need to offer the children? And I thought he was gonna say love, cause that's it for me. It's just opening my heart to love each child exactly for who she is, not for who she's supposed to be or who I want her to be, but exactly for who she is. That's not what he said. So what would you say? What would you say? Here's what Dr. John Medina said, and he is one of the ACEs study authors. He said, what we need to offer those children is safety. Safety, I said. Safety? And then I realized, unless a child feels safe with me, she can't learn. Unless a child feels safe in the classroom with the other children, she can't engage with the other children. Unless a new staff member feels welcome into the staff, even though she knows she's not been there like everybody else has, unless she feels state safe with that group, she can't give her best. And I realized Dr. John Medina was right. Safety is something we need to give those children. And I know that you're doing things to provide that. I know you're reaching out to children to provide that. One of the themes I'm gonna talk about here, guys, as we move on to happiness running through the streets to find you, is that we're gonna talk about hope. We're gonna talk about hope. And hope begins with taking as, how can I say this, guys? Being as kind to myself as I am to other people. Many of us, 
Many of us in early childhood are exquisite at taking care of other people. We are so good at reading their needs. We have high EQ, which means we read people as well as we read books. We can, we can, we can feel what's going on with people. And yet the person we leave until last to take care of is ourselves. So tonight, guys, this is for you. This is for you, and I wanna offer you hope. And I wanna say that no matter how bad things get, there is happiness running through the street to find you. And now I'm gonna prove this, okay? Let's go ahead and look at what happiness includes. And first thing, it means acknowledging the truth that there's trauma, that there's a bad time. If I flip off into denial, or I dissociate from my body, which as you may know, means just taking off and imagining I'm someplace else, which traumatized children are excellent at. If I take off leaving myself behind, I cannot offer what's inside myself. And so I invite each one of you to claim your true voice because you're the only person with your DNA. You're the only person like you on earth you have the phd on you remember that please you have the phd on you and you know what you can offer and for me i've got so many wounds i've got so many mistakes that i made i have so much shame that was put on me as a child i was told over and over again you ought to be ashamed of yourself and i believe them and yet here's the hope in the midst of this the hope is that i can use those wounds, I can use that sadness, I can use my own mistakes to be with myself in a way that's joyful and to help other people. So let's look at where on earth does humor, excuse me, does hope come from in the midst of a trauma? Because are you crazy? You might be looking at me like this woman's crazy. There's not much hope. People are dying. Yes, people are dying, but let's look at what else is happening. And here are the four characteristics that I have found I need, and honestly, a lot of other people need to get through this pandemic, this time of trauma. The first letter of hope in this acronym is humor. If I lose my sense of humor, it's all over. And you know that about you. When you can laugh in a heartbeat, endorphins get, get released. Um, and so the first thing to remember is where's my sense of humor and how can I claim it back? And even if I have to like picture a little kid in my class who's so funny running up to me with the boogers coming out the nose and wants to give me a big hug, honey, that's going to bring a smile to my face. So the first part of happiness running through the street to find us is how can I reclaim my humor? The second part is back to having the PhD in yourself, you have your own original way, your own unique way to bring value added, to bring joy, to bring clarity. You've got your own talents and a pandemic gives you the opportunity to fall back upon your own strengths. One of my strengths is, I know I, 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 I have courage. I'm just gonna say that out loud, I have courage to face some of the toughest things to face. And I rely upon that during this time of the pandemic because I get, can get really scared. The third part of hope is perspective. And I call that climbing up to the balcony. Climb up to the balcony or walk up to the mountaintop so we can look and get the big picture. The thing about trauma, the thing about pandemic is that it, it tells us to look down and keep our eyes just all around us. It's like a, a traumatized child becomes hypervigilant watching to see where the next threat is coming from. We lose perspective when we're in the midst of a pandemic. I invite you to do whatever it takes for you to step up to the balcony to get that perspective. And we're going to work on how we can do that every day. And sometimes it's even as simple as looking out the window. If you look out the window and just say to yourself, which I do a lot, Help me see something I didn't notice before. What are you gonna notice? And here's what's amazing to me. Last night, I lit, I lit a low and I lit my candles. I'm, I'm got the twinkle lights on. It's, it's very pretty. And I look in the window and I'm thinking, this is a slider to my backyard. What is in this window? And I get closer, I think, oh man, I hope that's not a big spider because 
I don't particularly like spiders around me. You know, I, I know spiders are our friends, but hey, I don't want one getting close. There's this big thing on my window. And I said, okay, be brave, walk up. I walked up, I looked at this thing. Do you know what it was? It was a peeper. And if you're from the country, you know what a peeper is. Peepers are those frogs that make that beautiful, beautiful sound. And there he was, or she was, with her suction cup, four fingers, right there for me. So I started singing to it. I, I said, honey, let's just sing. <laughs> so there we are. Humor, originality, perspective. That frog gave me perspective, that there's something beautiful out that window. I just had to ask to see something new, and there it was. And the last part, the last thing that gives me hope is emotional honesty. Here's the truth. When we go through trauma, the easiest thing is to run, to get out of there, to imagine it's not happening. And for those of us in early childhood, we are sophisticated at this. We can keep ourselves so busy that we forget that we're running. Honestly, work addiction, which is something I have, and running to, to take care of everybody, get everything done, that is escaping from the feeling. There have been more times than I can tell you about during this pandemic when I just had this deep sadness come over me. And sometimes I don't even know why the deep sadness is coming. But instead of running from it, which I learned to do as a child to survive, I feel the sadness. I feel it. I share it. I talk about it. I write in my journal about it. And when things get really bad, I go out in nature and I just cry out in the forest. I just cry because there's, it is sad. My uncle Art died and I didn't get to say goodbye. It is sad to see all these people that can't breathe. That is sad. So folks, stick with me here as I now check my time. Okay, um, folks. Okay, here we go. The thing about happiness running through the streets to find us is that there is hope in the midst of this. If I'm true to myself, if I reclaim my sense of humor, if I step back to get perspective so I can see the big picture, and if I'm honest with myself, which doesn't always mean I'm gonna be happy. There's a quote later from Fred Rogers, which, which I adore as I bring the brain up here. There's a quote from, quote from Fred Rogers who said, it's not that children need us to be smiling, like everything's great. What children need is to know that we are there emotionally honest with them and that our love for them embraces sadness. Our love for them embraces, embraces anger. Our love for them embraces loneliness. That is so helpful to me because I didn't have someone when I was a child to read stories to me. I didn't have anyone to sing a lullaby and I, I, I didn't have anyone who could help me keep perspective. You do that with children every day. You create programs where children come and they find sanctuary. Please don't ever forget the difference you're making. And now let's, let's step back from hope and look at what happens in times of the pandemic when the trauma can brain our, drain our brain. Why is that? Because look, if you look at the right side of your screen, you're gonna see red. And if you looked at your left-hand side of the screen, you're gonna see red. But on the left-hand side, you're gonna see red, which is this rich, lush, flowing blood spreading out all throughout the brain. On the right-hand side, what you're gonna see is the blood draining right down into the primitive part of our self. That is, as many of you know, the autonomic system, the part of ourselves that does not do high functioning. It simply keeps us alive. And we have these amygdala glands for them. They look like little almonds and their whole job is to keep us alive. This is what the pandemic does to us. It, it threatens us so that our brain goes right into the brain drain of blood and all we can think about is survival. How many, what, what am I gonna cook for dinner? What am I, how am I gonna get the groceries? How am I gonna take care of my mother? How am I gonna get, that's survival. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. We need to do that. However, here's what's sad. When I allow myself to go into being fear-based, fear-based me is not able to have humor, is not able to be imaginative, is not able to be creative. 
Fear-based me isn't much fun to be with. Oh, I'll get everything done and I'll be very efficient. But fear-based me is not my most lovable self. It's somebody who's just making it through the day. Pandemics, trauma mean that we just make it through the day. And look what happens if we allow fear to take over. And of course, fear could take over. It's everywhere. How many of you are not watching the news? <laughs> I don't watch it and, uh, except for a little bit because it's so hard, okay? So what I wanna say to you is, how can happiness run through the street to find me? Well, it means being emotionally honest with myself that when I allow fear to take over, my brain, my spirit is gonna drain of my powers to make a difference. All I can do is survive. So look what's happening. That blood is draining right down into the brain stem, right down into the amygdala gland. And all that amygdala gland knows to do is to spurt out, to tell the system to spurt out either adrenaline so we can keep busy, keep busy, keep busy, or to spurt out cortisol. And, the, and you know that cortisol is an enzyme that can cause harm. It can, it can actually wreck our systems after a while. The ACEs, the Adverse Childhood um, Experience Study talks about children like me who are exposed to cortisol endlessly get complex PTSD, which is what I have. And yet, and yet, if we can expose those children to just one loving source, one loving person, that can start to be reversed. So, okay, let's look at the difference between allowing the pandemic to get me so that I'm scared to death and I'm fear-based and the blood goes draining out and all I can do is think of how am I gonna survive and I'm gonna be hyper-vigilant. By the way, those of us that have PTSD, I'll, I'll tell you when I used to, remember when there were restaurants and we could go to restaurants? I still go to the very corner of the restaurant so I can scan. I can scan to see how I can get out if I need if something goes wrong and I need to get out. I can see who's there. Now I laugh with myself about that because I'm not afraid anymore, but my autonomic system is so knee jerk that it sends me into being hyper vigilant. So guys, look what happens when blood drains. We get into four options, fight, which most of us don't want to do. Uh, but we will, if, one of, if a child is being harmed, we'll step right up. Um, or if one of our values is harmed, we will fight for that. But what happens when we allow fear to take over is all we have are four options, to run away, to fight back, to freeze like a deer in the headlights, which means that is interesting because it comes from the fact that a predator will not go after an animal that looks dead. And I know, and you know, we, you probably had a child in your classroom and you're taking count. You said, my gosh, I didn't realize Laura was here. Laura may be the child who has taught herself to be invisible. Some children survive that way. Traumatized children have a lot of roles to play that they can do to get through the day. One is hero, doing everything right. And one is the lost child, the child that nobody sees because if you can't see the child, the child can't think she can't be harmed. Okay, so the, three, the four things that we do when we're under threat from the pandemic is we either fight, get all angry and cranky, we flee, we dissociate, we take off, we deny what's going on. We freeze because we're so scared. We just want to become invisible and say, oh God, get me out of here. The last thing we do is in many ways the saddest and that's called fawning. And by the way, it's trauma research that lets us know these four things that happen to us when we're scared. Because you've all heard, I'm, I'm pretty sure of the Stockholm syndrome. It's when the folk were in concentration camps and to survive they felt some of them that the only thing they could do was to make some kind of human connection with the guard and if they could do that that might keep them more alive fawning is people pleasing people pleasing is something i have done much of my life i grew up being afraid of authority figures and i grew up being really good at pleasing them People pleasing is again fear based. It's when I don't have confidence in myself. So I try to please people, make them happy, and then I become very codependent, getting my sense of myself from other people. So, folk, what happens when I let fear get to me from this pandemic is it's not a pretty picture. It does not bring out my best. Yes, it brings out me as a survivor, but life is more than just surviving. 
yes, there are times we have to just survive, put the food on the table, but there's more to us than that. And that's why happiness runs through the street to find us because in the midst of the worst of times is the best of times. So now let's look at the other side. Let's look at the brain when that... This is Kim. Hey, Kim, what's up, sweetie? Well, I just saw a really interesting question I think goes with what you're talking about right now. If okay. You have, if you have a minute to answer. She said she is a child of trauma herself. Mm. But she finds that she's very calm in the midst of this crisis. And is there anything you could share about that? Wow. I'm having a moment here of feeling exactly what you're saying. Because that comes to me. That comes to me. There was much violence in my family. There was much mental illness. There was incest in my family. And here's what I believe happens with trauma survivors. We go beneath all of it to the place where there is something deeper. And for me as a child, when things were threatening annihilation, I believe that there was something deeper that there was a joy that I could tap into. I never quit. I never gave up on hope as a child. And I had reason to. Sometimes I quit for a while, just because I was beaten so much that I blacked out and then I just felt hopeless. But I wanna say to that person, inside of each one of us, I'm not gonna be religious here, I just wanna speak spiritually. Inside of each one of us, is a soulful person who's on earth to make a difference. And when that calm comes, as it comes to me, I'm feeling like, thank you. All of this stuff that we endure, all of this loss can help us remember what's important. Yeah, and I'm gonna share a story about that right now. But first, you know what, Kim, remind me in another minute about Freda, Dieter Brandeis, because I want to talk about her. She was a teacher during a time of trauma. But let me just first, so that you guys can um, see what's going on with this slide, and the person who just said she feels calmness. This is what happens when we allow ourselves to breathe, when we allow ourselves to reset our system so that instead of being stuck in trauma, we can t open our hearts, climb up to the balcony, Remember to have hope and to get that perspective back. When that happens, and the, by the way, the quickest way to do that is to hit the reset button with humor. If I can laugh at myself in a heartbeat, I can breathe better, I feel better, I'm more fun to be with for me, not just for other people, but for me too. And what happens is if we reset our brain from the brain drain of the trauma, and we just allow ourselves to laugh at ourselves. Because I've always got thousands of things to laugh about about myself. You might too, right? When that happens, then the blood starts to flow to the brain and look, it spreads out and it goes especially to that, look how it's in that prefrontal cortex, which is, we call it the executive function. You guys know this, we're helping children develop their executive function because that's the part of us that keeps perspective. That's the part of us that can say, it's gonna be okay. I'm scared to death but there's something bigger here. When I was a, a child terrified in the night, terrified that someone might come in my room and sexually abuse me, and that did happen, I would also look up at the stars. And there's a beautiful quote. It's, um, it's something like, I never gave up hope because in the night, I know there will be stars. It's like me looking outside and thinking there's a spider on the door and it's this beautiful tree frog ready to sing to me. So folk, what I wanna say that's gonna be going on throughout our, our remaining half hour together is this. Trauma inflicts and strips our spirits, it strips our brain, it drains our brain of blood and it, and it, and it affects our immune systems. And that's why the ACEs study says that those of us 
who were traumatized as children have a much higher chance of stroke, of heart disease, all these things that my, of cancer, all these things that my family and perhaps your family has. And yet, and yet the truth is, if we can reclaim that hopeful, that loving part of ourselves, we can overcome that ACEs literature that says we're hopeless. One of the, if you get, if you read my book, you'll see that one of the first stories is about how angry I got when I heard a person who was a specialist uh, in zero to three children. And she said to me, if we don't get to these, and she was saying beautiful things about developmentally appropriate. I love what she was saying. But then she said what I've heard a lot, especially from research, she's researchers, she said, if we don't get to these children, between zero and three, they are irreparably, irre I can't even say it because it upsets me. They're irreparably damaged. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall and all the king's horses, help me out here, and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. No, that's not true. Even with this pandemic, even with this hopelessness, even with this loss, we can connect with each other and find the hope and through loving interconnection, even the child who is the worst abused can reclaim her life. I, I thought I couldn't live past 17, but I did. I thought I couldn't live past 21, but I did. Here I am 74, what am I doing here? It's because I have connected with beautiful people who have given me hope and reminded me to see that in myself. So folk, I'm on a, I'm on a switch to, um, oh dear, I sound like a politician who keeps saying folk. Let me just say, my friends, look at this. This comes from the book also. Trauma can be my most rigorous guide. Trauma is my unchosen, who would have chosen this pandemic, but compelling pathway to a life, I have to get my glasses on here, to a life of meaning an uplifting appreciation of beauty and a deeply anchored conviction to make the world better for every child. That's what this time can do for us, even if it's just one child that I reach out to today and let that child know, honey, I love you forever and always. I just love you forever ever and always. That's one thing that child will remember. And I love this, this Carrie Fisher said this um, before she died. She was a trauma survivor too, and she said, take your broken heart and turn it into art. Take all the pain and all the fear and all the sadness and turn it into something to give back. And see that diamond? That's what we become in early childhood. We become the diamond because of all of the trauma that we've been through. All of this pain of the pandemic, all of the loss makes us harder but also more beautiful and i don't mean hardening of the heart i mean it gives us the resilience and the strength to, to carry on and there is a beauty in that um so i want to show you let's look at hope okay let's look at hope and by the way there's a, an article um if you want to get more in depth about this that was in childcare exchange it was called um a broken into wholeness and it talks about Humpty Dumpty you know like this this whole thing like the children are broken with they're gonna be broken the rest of their lives if they don't get help between zero and three and I love that this man who was a, a priest and and he's he he, he said um, and he's this I, I say this in the morning may I have the courage today to postpone my dream no longer but do at last what I came here for and waste my heart on fear no more. The truth is, folk, uh, sorry, my friends, <laughs> forgive me. The truth is, my friends, fear can take me away from beauty. It's hope that puts me back in touch with beauty, both the beauty within and the beauty without. So now let's look at these four qualities of hope. And excuse me a second as I check my time I have got one of these iPhones that says Face ID, but it doesn't recognize me. Okay, I'm looking, we got about 22 minutes, that's perfect. Here is the truth about humor. Humor can save the day. It can save us from having a traumatizing time with this pandemic. It can lift us out of the autonomic system and right back into that hopeful part of our brain, the executive function. Because look, 
humor and laughter trigger that prefrontal cortex into activity and that's where we get new ideas that's where we can become problem solvers that's where we can remember to laugh we become generous we get new ideas and trust me if you think of a time when you could laugh at yourself just remember that all of the birds came flying home all of the beautiful birds came flying home because they came with them whispering in your ear here's something you can do here's another thing you can do because humor resets the brain so the first part of hope is please remember your sense of humor and if you need someone who's going to make you laugh get in touch with that person for me sometimes it's a dog yeah it's a dog so here's what um I love this. This is from Jan Ponsky, a neuroscientist, and I know you've got the point about humor. But he's, he says, look, play is the brain's jungle gym. And I'm going to read this to you fast like it's a commercial, and I, and I hope I don't offend anybody, but you know how they have to get squeeze all that information into commercials. So here we go. You can read it. I'll just be very quick. Play still is like just simulates the nuclear emotion depresses it. If you get an erection that lasts more than four hours, oh my goodness, you do, 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 executive functions are processed. Forgive me, I hope I didn't offend anybody. That was not my intention. But the point here is, if I can keep my sense of humor and not let things get me down, my brain can be highly functioning. I can play again. I can laugh again. And here's what Stuart Brown, he's the expert on adults in play. He's the expert on you and me. He's the one who says, wait a minute, he says, when people are able to find our sense of play in our work, we become truly powerful. This is what the Pied Piper is. The Pied Piper is the one who said, I can entrance, enhance, uplift, and bring joy to these children because I can remind them that inside each of us is that soul that just wants to sing and just wants to play. So the traumatized person who spoke before, yes. That deep sense of calm. When we as adults can find our own sense of play, we can help others find that. And that is a beautiful thing to remember during this pandemic. Did you play today? Did I play today? You bet I did. <laughs> you bet I did. And here's the second part of hope. It's called originality. And what does originality mean? I think Queen Latifah nailed it, don't you? She said, be bold, be brave enough to be your true self. Carl Jung said that everybody came to the earth as a unique being, and I believe that. I also personally believe that we each came here because we have something unique to give back. I'm a recovering attorney. I didn't feel like I was giving that much as an assistant attorney general. I know I did good work and I don't want to demean that. But it was only when I got to early childhood education when I could support you, geniuses that you are in terms of emotional intelligence, when I could say to you, you are making a difference and it's my honor to be with you, that's when I knew I was doing what I was meant to do on earth. If you just take a minute and ask yourself, are you doing what you're meant to do on earth? Guess what? There are more people in early childhood education who are gonna say yes, than there are people who are gonna say no. Because we know when we touch the life of a child, we change the world for the better. And this is something that I love. This is something that comes out of the pandemic. When we're living through hard times, there are four things we need to feel. And this also has to do with our originality. We need to help children feel this, and we as adults need to feel this. Do I feel inner control? Do I have choices? And the answer to that question is yes. You have made choices every day. You can't go out and do the things you love to do. Maybe you can't go to work. Maybe you can't even get out to hug people, right? But you have the freedom to choose. Whenever I can, I get out there. I take a walk and I go see my, I go see, um, I've named them Calo and Diego. They are red-winged blackbirds. And I now hope, know how to make their whistle and they listen when I come by the pond and I've watched them and I know how the males do this thing with their wings where they bring their wings out so you really see the orange on the wings and I've started doing that and they do it with me and I'm thinking do I care if somebody is watching not really because <laughs> I'm laughing and I'm connecting in the midst of this time when I dearly miss hugging people, 
my pals, the birds are out there doing their thing with the wings too. So we need to feel to get through the pandemic without contracting post-traumatic stress disorder. We need to feel like we've got choices. That's number one. Two, children let us know this every day. Wonder, awe, curiosity. Every day I say to myself, let me look at something anew. It's like looking out the window and saying, okay, show me something I haven't seen before. Or sometimes I'm driving. Back in the day when we used to drive, remember when we needed to buy gas? Uh, we, we used to, um, I, what I would do is if I was driving down the, down, down the highway, I would, because I'd, I'd commute a lot for work, I'd, I'd say, so show me something that I didn't notice before. And there would always be something beautiful. So every day, especially during the pandemic, it's time to see something in a way we've never seen it before. Third thing we need is connection which is to reach out to one another in safety and in love. And if we can't do that physically, thank everything that we live in a time where we can do this Zooming stuff, okay? And the last thing about hope is Robert Frost nailed it when he said the best way out is through. This is a tough time. I can't pretend it isn't. I don't want to pretend it isn't because I know that diamond that emerges from the rough time, that diamond is me and that diamond is you. So all the, I'm keeping my eyes on the prize. This worst time at all, this worst time of all can become my best time. And, and look, Fred Rogers, so helpful. Nobody else can live your life. You're the only one. And I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. But every single one of us can bring what's unique about us to life and then share that. That's powerful, that's originality. So guys, the next thing we need after humor and originality, which is being true to ourselves, is perspective. And thank God for folk like Eleanor Roosevelt. And by the way, before we get the Eleanor quote, look at what's going on in that picture there. This is me, I showed up at like three in the morning in Anchorage, Alaska, snow everywhere. And I'm in the, I'm in the Hilton Hotel to speak at the um, Anchorage AEYC conference. And look, I'm surrounded by these bears. And, and check it, my fingers are right next to those claws. Meanwhile, look what's going on on my face. I'm smiling. <laughs> Because I got this great perspective. Here I am in Alaska. I can see things in Alaska I don't get to see in Massachusetts. And so look, Eleanor Roosevelt, who faced a lot of pain, right? She said, we gain strength, courage, and confidence by every experience in which we stop to look fear in the face. I must do the thing I feel I cannot do. And I'm noticing my time, guys. I think I've got about five minutes left. So this thing about climbing up to the balcony of perspective, I ask you, how can you do this every day? When you're stuck at home, you can walk outside, right? You can walk outside. And I love, for example, that in Bella Italia, people went out on their balconies and they started singing to each other. I love that in New York State, New York City every night, people start banging seven o'clock to say thank you. This is so heartening. And, and look what Rumi said. He said, our hardest times can invite us to learn the most deep lessons in life. The dark thought, the shame, the malice, bring it, welcome it at the door, stay six feet away, but welcome it at the door, <laughs> invite it in laughing, be grateful for what, whatever comes to us in this pandemic because each has been sent as a guide from beyond. What I came to as a child who survived incest, a child who survived getting beaten until I blacked out, what I, and a child whose mother was mentally ill, and uh, my job was to take care of her, what I came to was each one of those was in its own way a blessing. In its own way a blessing. I can walk in a classroom and I can tell who the child who's hurting is and I can be available to that child. So I wanna share with you um, this process of looking at trauma. It's a process that can either take us down or it can lift us up. And Kim, I still don't need to talk about Freda Dieter uh, uh, Brandeis, which I will, but I wanted to share this process with you. It comes from Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who later disowned it. 
But you know what? There's truth in it because when we're faced with trauma, the first thing it's natural for us to do is up in the upper left-hand corner. We want to deny and pretend it's not happening. I wanted to pretend that I could go to my uncle's funeral. I couldn't. I couldn't, but I was in denial. The next thing we do is what we're being taught to do. We isolate, we separate. We can even be in our families and be separated, hiding out inside of ourselves. That's something that comes naturally when we're traumatized. Little children hide. Um, and then we get into the whole thing about feeling guilty. Oh my God, I'm not doing enough. How many of you feel that way? Yeah. Or we shame ourselves or we get into bargaining. God, if you'll just get me through this, I promise, I promise. But then we know that that doesn't feel right either. If we let trauma bring us down, we get to a state of despair. And look at that whole left-hand column. That's when my brain drains of its energies. I become fear-based. I lose my self-esteem. The problem gets huge because I can't be a problem solver. I become a victim and a reactor, not an actor. What trauma teaches me is I can become an actor, not a reactor. Fear can control me or I can say I can make one small choice right now right now to do something better. I could get scared, for example, that I'm gonna run out of time, which I might. And I'm still gonna say, you know what, it's okay. So take a look at what happens here. Take a look at what happens. And by the way, just saying, okay, I'm not worried right now. What happens is at some point with trauma, we get angry. When I was a child and my father told me I was too dumb to get a scholarship. I got angry, not at him, because that would have led to violence, but I got angry and I went into that New York State Regent Scholarship exam and I said, I'm going to get this test. I'm gonna do it. And when a month later they announced the first person who got the test, it was my name and I felt like crying because I channeled that anger. This is not fair what's happening. I channeled that into clarity to get something done that was useful. Then if we can accept what's going on, then we can take action. There's a, a saying, the three A's, awareness of what's going on. Yeah, we're in a pandemic. Acceptance, yeah, there are things we can't do, but there are things we can do. Action, what can I do to make my world a little bit better? And here are the opportunities, the predictable opportunities. Um, I'm looking at about six minutes here, guys. The predictable opportunity is when we're in a, a traumatic time of this pandemic, Every knee-jerk reaction, fight, flight, fawn, freeze, all of that gives me an opportunity. For example, if I'm in denial, I'm pretending, oh yeah, mm -hmm, there's not a pandemic going on. I'm pretending, oh yeah, I don't miss giving my son a hug. Yeah, sure. No, I do. There are times I just cry because I'm so sad and so lonely and I feel some of us just feel for the world, right? We feel the sadness. And yet, and yet I have a choice with that sadness. I can do, oh my goodness, I think I skipped it. Well, no, we're going to get there. Emotional clarity. I can just, uh, this is Kim. Hey, and Kim. I do want to end things to 8.30. Please feel free to cover your content based on what I'm seeing in the chat box. Nobody's racing away, but if somebody does need to leave, they certainly yeah. do. Okay, thanks, hon. Um, yeah, I think I'm okay. I just lost it there for a minute, but that's part of reclaiming my joy. And how do I do that? I remind myself that I am so gifted to be connected with you wherever you are. Maybe you're in Waverly, Ohio. Maybe you're in Toledo. Maybe you're in Gahana. Maybe you're in Columbus. Maybe you are in Sandusky. Or maybe you are in the Rio Grande Valley. I know that there's a buddy watching from the Rio Grande Valley. Maybe you're in New York. Wherever you are, we are in this together. And there's hope for that. We're helping each other out. We can cry together. Yes, this is a very sad time. And yet we can also open our hearts to each other. I have held so many people and will continue to hold so many people in my heart simply by listening to them. Tell me what's going on. Yes, just listening, even if it's through a Zoom conversation. So look, guys, 
trauma puts us into all kinds of behavior that is just about surviving, it's not about living. Denial is about surviving. As a child, I had to pretend to myself I wasn't in danger. I had to go to school and pretend I'm fine, thank you very much. Denial is destructive because it takes me out of the moment. What can I do to heal myself and get healing when I'm in denial? And you're gonna have a lot of children in denial. I'm fine, it's good, it's good, it's good. We can help the child face and acknowledge what's going on. Fred Rogers did not say, pretend that we're happy. He said, have enough love in my heart to accept the sadness. The other thing we do is we isolate. Well, look, what is Kim and OAEYC doing right now? They're creating a space where we can all reach out to each other. I wish I could see you. I wish I could hear you. But I will read everything you write, and I will respond to you. Yes, because it matters to me what you're doing. Okay, guilt, guess what? Women, in particular, are real good at feeling guilty and blaming ourselves for things. And 70% of women take things personally. Guess what? When I start to feel guilty, that can take me down. Here's what I've learned. <laughs> I've learned to take responsibility and apologize for what I have done, but to not take on anybody else's responsibility. Does that make sense? I can say to my son, Nick, I apologize. What I said was inappropriate. But if he says something, I don't have to take on his guilt and go down the tube. Because if I go down the tube, I lose my gifts. Despair is what happens when I give up. I give up if I become a victor, a victim and a reactor. To get through the pandemic, to get through trauma, I need to choose one small action, even just one small action. So yes, I can get angry and say, I'm angry that, well, I was angry when I went for a walk and I saw a sign that said, you can't go in there, girl. I couldn't go to the park I usually love to walk in. I was angry, but I turned around and I said, Holly, Elisa, what did you learn to do in your life when something is shut down? I turned around, I walked in the other direction, and that's when I reclaimed and refound my red winged blackburns and I started singing to them and doing the thing with them. And yeah, that would give me the power to make a difference. So guys, in the end, we can get taken down and kneecapped by something. We are hurting. We are being hurt. And at the same time, with that emotional clarity, this is the last thing I wanted to talk about, by being honest emotionally rather than pretending that we're not in a trauma, by being honest, we can get help. The fog in the forest can clear. Here's what I didn't have as a child. I didn't have someone like you to listen to me. I didn't have someone that could look at me and say, you've got talent, but you also, there must be something going on. And in fact, when a teacher said to me, he said many kind things like, you're very quick, you're intelligent, blah, blah, but something must be going on at home. I knew I couldn't talk about it. Don't talk, don't trust, don't feel. Those were the rules I had. And I said to him, oh no, it's fine. But you know what? Simply the fact that he reached out and saw that in me, open my heart. That's what you can do with a child. I, I heard of the child. This was right here in my own town of Fitchburg. It's, it's only with the heart that we can feel what's going on with the child. It's not just all of the book learning, although that's important. It's listening to each child from the heart and listening to each, the adult, excuse me, to the child and each adult from the heart, because here's the deal. There was a child who said to his teacher, teacher, you have a knife in your brain like I do, don't you? What would you say to that child? What would you say? That teacher had the loving presence of heart to say to that child, and being emotionally honest, she said, guess what? Yes, I have a really bad headache. I have a bad headache because my mother is sick and she's, she can't be healed. And I feel very sad about that. And then the teacher said, and, it's, and you said you have a knife in your brain too. Do you want to tell me more about what's 
what you're feeling. And this little boy talked about the troubles he was facing at home. And the whole year she was beside that little boy and she was supporting him because she didn't run from the emotional clarity. He told her he was sad and what an amazing image that child used. So look what Fred Rogers says to us. Look what we can do for ourselves. We can listen to our own pain, not run from it and say, what can I learn from this pain? Well, I'm going to tell you another thing I learned from this pain. I learned that I never grieved because I, I didn't have the ability. I, no one taught me how to grieve. When I went through another pandemic, when I was four and five years old, I was in first grade and one of my really dear friends was Claire. And Claire and I were playing. And then the next day I couldn't go play with Claire and nobody said why. And the next day I heard Claire was sick and nobody said what was going on. And then the next day I heard Claire was in the hospital and I didn't understand. I had the understanding of a four and five year old. All I knew is that my heart was sad because I wanted to play with my friend. And then I heard that Claire had polio and Claire had died. All these years, I never grieved for the loss of my friend. This is emotional clarity. This is emotional honesty. Here's what I've done during this pandemic. I have wept for Claire. I've said, Claire, I'm so sorry you lost your life at age five. Here's what I loved about you, Claire. I'm so sorry I didn't get to come to say goodbye. Claire, I love you. I'm so glad for those times we have together. I've written in my journal, I've talked about it. The sadness that comes from these losses can heal us. I didn't know as a child, we didn't have grief counselors. My mother was psychotic, she couldn't help me. My father couldn't help me. Nobody helped me with Claire. What did I do? I sneaked and walked all the back ways to get to the local community church because I thought maybe Claire would be there and I could say goodbye. And I got up on my tippy toes so I could see her and it was only dark in there. It was only dark. But look what Fred Rogers is saying to us as the adults in the room, at many times throughout their lives, children will feel the world has turned topsy-turvy. It has. It's not our smiling and pretending that it's beautiful. That's not it. That's not what helps children feel secure or adults. What helps is knowing that love can hold many feelings, sadness, pain, sorrow, and that we can count on each other to love each other in the worst of times until the world turns right side up again. And here's what I want to leave you guys with, because I think we probably, yeah, time is just about up. I want to tell you about Frida. I love this woman. I wrote about her in that article in Exchange. She was an art teacher, and she was put in a camp. It was called Theresienstadt because she was Jewish. And that was the play, that was the, uh, the concentration camp where they, the Nazis arranged it so that it looked good. There was like an orchestra there. So if people came to visit, uh, they, the Nazis could show, look, we're really being kind. We're just separating these people because they're different. Freda Dieter Brandeis said to them, the Nazi, she said, look, I can take these children off your hands, but you need to give me something. What is it? Give me some simple art supplies. And they did. And this woman, a simple art teacher, took that moment of that atrocity of people dying, of people being separated from their family. She took that atrocity and here's what she did in that moment. And I wanna leave you with this. She helped those children create art. She gave them crayons, she gave them watercolors. She let them, encourage them to create. And yes, they created sadness, yes but they also created watercolors of themselves, looking up at the sky, picking out the clouds and the shapes of the clouds. They also created their villages being beautiful again, not bombed out. That is what she did. And for the children that, that didn't have the motor skills, they sang. There's, the, you know what, another quick reset of the brain from despair to hope is to sing. 
just sing, even if you don't have a voice. I mean, I go out there and I sing because it's healing. We can sing together. So what Freda did also is she helped some of the children do um, instruments and, and there were adults to help them with that. She helped some other children put on plays. And through all of that art, in that short amount of time she was with those children, she helped those children live in the moment and find the beauty in the moment. So here's what I, I wanna say to me and to you. At the time of this pandemic, when there is pain, there is sorrow, there's loss, there's isolation, it's very, very sad. Everything is insecure. We need to go to the deeper part of ourselves, that part of ourselves where we can claim hope. And in the midst of that hope, ask, what can I do today to make this world around me better? What can I do today? And I just heard a story today. I reached out to a, an older gentleman. Hey, I'm 74, he's 79. I reached out to him. He's got COPD, he's at high risk. He lives alone. He wrote back and he said, this beautiful thing happened today. You know the little house next door to where I live? Well, there's a state trooper moving in there and I'm thinking, thank God, that's great. This guy can look out for my friend. And he said, the state trooper has a yellow lab puppy named Mimi. <laughs> and the state trooper heard that I used to walk the, our dog, Toby, big 90 pound yellow lab around. And the state trooper asked me, could I during the daytime just take Mimi out for short walks? That's all he can do because of his COPD. What a beautiful thing. And I wouldn't have known about this if I had not reached out. There is a spiritual principle that if I simply take one action toward hope, bigger actions toward hope will come to me. And it just works that way. So folk, what I want to, my friends, <laughs> what I want to say is, look at this, Emily Dickinson, isolated from her tribe. She was different. She was lesbian. She was uh, looked different. She talked differently. She was brilliant. She was a genius, but she was one of those geniuses that people didn't quite get. So they isolated her from her tribe. Look what she said. In addition to saying, this is my love letter to the world that never wrote to me. Emily Dickinson said, and I carry this in my heart, like you maybe have a quote or a poem that you carry in tough times like this to bore you up. And as a trauma survivor, I memorized so much poetry that when my heart was breaking, I could call that poetry out and that would help heal my heart. So here's what Emily said. Read it with me if you want to. I think it's beautiful. She said, hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the song without words and never stops at all. Thank you for never stopping in making a difference to the children and the families and to your own family and to yourself. Hold on to hope, hold on to humor, hold on to being your true self, hold on to stepping up for perspective and please remember that emotional clarity is liberating, it is not punishing. So thank you so much. Kimberly, I think we're out of time, but it's, I'm still seeing that there are close to 1,800 people. God bless you. There's so many other things I wanted to share with you, but maybe next time. And just wanna say thank you for who you are and what you do. And that goes to you too, Kim.